Hello everyone, I'm the founder and CEO of Gray Empire 34, and my name is Cassius Gray, and today you guys better be ready for this one. I got a special treat for you. I'm doing what's called Generation Y and Z Tea Time Chat, and so every month I will reach out and find someone from Generation Y and Z that's disadvantaged. And today I got a special treat for you. I got my man, Ibrahim Cologne. He's gonna be my second person that we interview for Generation Y and Z Tea Time Chat. But I wanna give all of that time to him because he deserves it. So that's why I want to touch on a few things with you uh, before we do this tea time chat. So, my name is Cassius, Cassius Gray. And that's a powerful name. And I'll tell you why. You see, my father named me Cassius for a reason because he knew I was going to be great he named me Cassius after Cassius Clay the greatest of all time when I was growing up I didn't understand what that mean and now I do know what Cassius means because I'm going to tell you a story because I like to tell stories you see my father he was a great man he passed away July 6th of this year and he was suffering but the day before he passed away I was able to do a FaceTime chat with him and I just said, Dad, I got you. I, I, I see what your vision was. Because he never really talked about it. He never explained it to me. So I really didn't understand. But I got it. And I told my dad, you can go now. Because I got you. And so reason why he named me Cassius is because he was part of the civil rights movement in Memphis, Tennessee. He marched with Dr. Martin Luther King in Memphis. He was at the Mason Temple in Memphis where Dr. Martin Luther King made his last speech where he said, I seen the mountaintop dad was right there and my mom too and so this was in 1968 I was born in 1971 and when he named me Cassius it was for a reason that I never knew but now I do know I'm going to tell you why so, in 1996, I was in the military, and I was working and living in the Sinai Desert of Egypt for the Multinational Force and Observers. It's a peacekeeping mission. And so I was there for one year. first month I wanted to see what my colleagues were doing on the weekend because there's really nothing to do and so there were gyms and uh, also bars uh, where we have social gatherings 
And so I, I, I done that for about a month, but I got bored, I got tired because it was the same repetitive things. And I was in Egypt. I found this magazine. It was a garbage can. And it was right before Halloween. And so, because I was traveling almost every weekend, uh, the military had a special bus where it was free. Get on the bus, the bus driver would take you to Cairo. But I was just bored. So I wanted to really get to experience as much as I could of Egypt. And so the military had a shuttle service, free of charge. They would depart right after work on Friday. I believe it was Friday. And it would return on Sunday, I believe. And the bus drive, the trip was about five hours or something like that. It was a long time, I remember that. But I would go every weekend because Egypt was beautiful. I got to see the pyramids and went, traveled to Aswan and Luxor. Done a lot of things in Egypt. But when I was in Egypt, I wanted to learn from the people of Egypt and what was, and I wanted to see their stories. So I would go to the markets and that's where I would learn the stories. The markets were big, it was like a maze. You could get lost in there. But I went to the market because I had this magazine tell you about this magazine. This magazine is very special to me. This magazine has been with me since 1996. And I'm going to tell you why. Okay. I found this magazine in a garbage can. Right? Sports Illustrated. I'm a sports junkie. So I picked it up. read it on the bus. Yeah. And, and, I, and I read it on the bus. And there were two pictures that stood out to me. One is behind me the other one is in my, my family room. I'll show it to you. But I want you guys to get a closer look of this, this magazine. So stand by. So here is the magazine. It's dated July 15, 1996. Sports Illustrated. And I'm going to show you something. I don't know exactly where it's at. I'm very delicate with this because I don't want to damage this. It's over 25 years old. See this picture right here? I was in the market and I had the magazine. I saw this young painter who was extremely poor and he wanted to sell me one of his paintings and I said you know what I would like for you to paint this picture for me because my name is Cassius and so also there's another picture I had him paint it's this one I love basketball but let me show you something you 
see this. You see that. It's a young guy by the name of Hassan Issey. He did a great job, fantastic job. So with that picture, I don't know why, but it was it, it immediately. I don't know why, but it became my my favorite painting to this day. And so, uh, since I purchased this painting in 1996, I always had it on display in my house always and I was able to find some old pictures and I'm going to show it to you this was in my, my room in the military it's on the wall as you can see I had thumbtacks in there okay I just had the print okay because I couldn't afford at the time to buy a frame so I but I wanted to display it and I waited for a few months before I saved up to buy the frame that it is over the picture today that frame is over 26 years old as well but I want to show you another picture this was in my room and I stayed in a trailer. It was very small, but it was fine for me. And here's a picture. So this picture in my room. But also, you see that picture? There's an FBI hat. I'm gonna tell you another story. Here's that same FBI hat. It's also 20, 25, 26 years old. You know, it's old. Okay. And let me tell you the story behind that. And you see this picture right here. This picture was made by Angelo. Angelo, I learned about Angelo through Shalene and Peter. And Angelo is a talented artist, but because he lives in the Cape Flats, there just isn't oppor an opportunity for him to shine. Okay? But you can see his talent. This is one of my favorite pictures. Those eyes tell the story. And I always look at those eyes because she talks to me. She talks to me. She tells me what I need to do. And so, She's a black queen. And I listen. But anyway, uh, no, she's an African queen. She's an African queen. And I listen to her. But anyway, uh, Shalene, Peter, hey, when I get to Cape Town, you know I'm coming. Because y'all are my family. And y'all know that. See, and then, and see, Here's the other picture. 25, 26 years old. Still going. Looking good. Yeah. And so when I was in Cairo, I was invited to a Halloween party at the U.S. Embassy in Cairo. And man, that embassy was beautiful. It was huge. It was spectacular. Uh, it was amazing. And so at this Halloween party, one guy approached me and he was African-American. He was the only African-American I've seen. So I wanted to hear his story. So he told me his name was Alfred Finch. See, I'll never forget that name because I'm from Memphis. 
I love basketball. And one of my most favorite coaches of all time was Larry Finch. Or back then we used to call it Memphis Tigers or Memphis State. But Coach Finch was a genius. He recruited primarily players from his city and helped develop them. He was a mentor to the community. And you see, Larry Finch, he, not only was he a great coach, he also played professional basketball. He was born, he was born in Memphis also. So I like the fact that he, he gave back. He gave back, he done an excellent job. You know. Andre Turner, he's a friend of mine. He played for the historic Memphis Tigers, Memphis State Tigers when they went to the Final Four alongside with, y'all know who I'm talking about, Keith Lee, William Belford, Baskerville Holmes, Doom Haynes, come on, y'all know, that was a great team. And Andre followed in his footsteps. He followed in Larry Finch's footsteps. <clears throat> and Andre followed in Larry Finch's footsteps. He played professional basketball, then he came back to Memphis. Came back to his, the place where he grew up, Mitchell area, Walker Holmes. He coached for Mitchell and done a great job. And I like that, I was watching him. Very, very smart guy. But Alfred Finch, that, and that's the reason why I'll never forget Alfred Finch name is because uh, there's a connection. Uh, there's a connection. Larry Finch, Alfred Finch. But anyway, uh, Alfred Finch was a special agent with the FBI. He was the legat attache in Cairo. This was in 1996. And there was a lot going on. There was a lot of suicide bombings at that time. He was black. I didn't see nobody else but him. And he mentored me. And one day, he invited me into his office. I even met his wife. I think she's from Arkansas. I remember, I still remember those days. And one day he invited me into his office. My first time going into the embassy. And he had a huge office. He said, graduated from college, served in the military, but you don't have really any law enforcement experience. So when you get out of the military, try to find a job where you can get that experience. And then you should be ready to apply for the FBI. And he gave me that hat with the little pen. I still have it. Oh, this is 1996. I still have that hat. And I showcase it. But I didn't know why. But now I do. It motivated me to achieve my goals. Just like picture Muhammad Ali motivated. Because that hat represented a lot to me. Because I got to see something special. A black special agent in charge. He was doing great. And I wanted to be like him. And I listened to him. I got out the military. I never, never re-enlisted. I got out. Started working for the Department of Energy on the special response team, which is the equivalent of a SWAT team. Then I became a deputy probation officer. And I worked with juvenile delinquents at an aftercare boot camp at Juvenile Hall. 
Then I said, now's my time to apply. And it was the grace of God. When I was searching for that FBI position, there was also a position, <clears throat> a vacancy for diplomatic security special agent. And I started doing my research. And I said, well, I'll apply for the FBI and Department of State. The State Department called first. I jumped on it. And it was a great decision. And so, my very first overseas assignment was in a country called Uzbekistan. And when I arrived there, reality struck me. I was the only African American, basically, in that country. At the embassy where I worked, there were maybe, if I recall correctly, four other African Americans. Outside the embassy for a whole year, I did not see one person that looked like me. Not one. But I embraced it. I did. Because it was amazing. Because I got to learn about the community, some of the struggles, some of the kids that played basketball. I was even on the honorary player on the Uzbekistan national basketball team. Because they didn't see color. They just never seen an African American before. Most people haven't. And so there was no discrimination. It was curiosity. And so I had a wonderful time there. I still have friends to this day from Uzbekistan. I'm coming back, y'all. Yeah, I'm coming. I got some big things planned for you, Uzbekistan. Be. And when I was in Uzbekistan, I did not see anybody for a whole year. And then once again, I was in the community. So I went to a Catholic church. That was the only church that was around. And there was a nun who was from Africa. And I was the only African or African American I seen for a whole year. And I would go to that church every Sunday just to let her know I'm with you. Then also, and so, and so, about, and then also, uh, and I said, y'all, I don't, and that's a true story, but I embraced it because I was able to get out of my comfort zone. See, I wasn't afraid. And so, I learned something very valuable. As a diplomat, it's our job to really embrace the community. I mean all of it. Especially the disadvantaged areas. Especially the disadvantaged youth. And so that's why I created this nonprofit corporation. Because I want to give back. So my my daughter, she's very special to me. Very special. And she is my vice president of this nonprofit corporation. Because we're about providing generational legacy with diplomatic value. I'm going to tell you a story about that. It's pretty deep. But my daughter, she is the vice president. I call her Princess. She's awesome. She's smart, intelligent, driven, 
and also beautiful. Then I have my oldest son, 16. I call him Prince Jim. He's good. He's extremely determined. He's a stud. Trust me. He's going to do great things. Well, he's already doing great things. Already. He's only 16. And my youngest son. I call him Prince. Yes, he's better. Yes. He's special. You never get to meet him. You know what I'm talking about. No, and but last but not least. extremely well. He's he's doing extremely well. He's a recruiter for the Army National Guard in Memphis. And he's provided opportunities for a lot of disadvantaged youth. He's not afraid to go in the inner city because that's where he came from. Because he wants to give back because he knows there's opportunities and great ones for joining the U.S. military. And so it's a no-brainer for me, for me to add him into this nonprofit corporation. So he's one of the board members like my two boys. That's it, y'all. We're going to keep this in the family. I'm going to tell you why. Uh, the Kennedy family came for the anniversary, the 50th anniversary of the Ripple of Hope's speech. The Ripple of Hope speech. Uh, very powerful speech made by Robert Kennedy. F. Kennedy and uh, it was very powerful and I'll tell you what I mean by power so the Kennedys when they came they came in large numbers okay? but it was mostly the young generation the youth I thought that was beautiful. I mean, they were all ages, from like seven or eight up to 20, 25, 30. You know, but it was the majority of the young generation. And they came to South Africa. I was with the Kennedy family, and we traveled to Robben Island. And we were able to visit uh, the actual cell that Nelson Mandela spent over 20 something years in. We were able to go inside the cell, and I was told that that's really rare. So I was able to go in the cell where Nelson Mandela, and it was tiny, y'all, where he spent over 20 years. And for a brief moment, I felt his pain, but I also felt something else. He had time. He had time to think and plan. And he used his time wisely because when he got out, he became the first African president in South Africa. He was about change. And so that stuck. I said, this man sacrificed so much. But when he got out, he continued to work. And his goal 
was to bring equality to all people. And so that, that really touched me up. So before we went to Robin Island, you know, you have to get on a boat and it's a charter boat. It's a huge boat because it, it seats hundreds of people, okay? But the Kennedy, they chartered the boat and one of the Kennedys who was a, uh, he was in college. He was running late, okay? Very late maybe about 30, 45 minutes. So we had to wait on him, okay? The whole sh boat, we waited on this one guy. And he came and uh, no one admonished him. No one said anything negative, but he knew he made a mistake. So he sat down by himself and just tried to collect himself. And so I went over and started talking to him. He told me something really cool. He said, yeah, the reason why we are in South Africa is part of our, our history lessons. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, we have lessons about our history. If you're born a Kennedy, you have to know where it came from, where it started, which was with Patrick Kennedy. They wanted that legacy to last. And they're gonna, and I'm, they're doing the right thing because they're teaching all the Kennedys at an early age the history, the history of their legacy. And so I thought that was really cool. Then he told me this really stood out. He said, "All of us Kennedys." go to Ivy League schools. And I said, wow, that's powerful. Because education is the key. They all have the opportunity to get the best education. And I've visited a few Ivy League schools. It's on a whole different level. Whole different level. And so that vision that Patrick Kennedy had it's gonna last forever. It's called generational wealth, and generational knowledge, and generational history. That's what it's called. And so when I started Grand Power 34 in January, that's what I wanted to do. My vision is for every gray to have the gray in their genes to go to college not any college, Ivory League schools. It happen. I want all of the grades to at least learn one foreign language. It could happen because I'm using Gray Empire 34 to start it. I'm planting a seed. And then it's up to my kids to continue to to share this information to their kids and then, and then to their kids and their kids we're going to get there one day because this is in my heart this is what I, I want to do I'm retiring uh, at the end of September the reason why I'm retiring is one, I have some disabilities and I no longer can work. Just can't. And number two, I want to focus on Gray Empire 34. And I want to provide educational resources and basketball resources for disadvantaged youth. But the education, I'm not talking about STEM. English, history. I want to give up, give the kids lifelong lessons because it's really important 
to have overall well-being. Okay, and that's the goal. You want to have, you want to be complete. Also, take care of your mentals, guys. It's nothing wrong with going to a medical professional. talk about how you feel there's nothing wrong with that because it works I know you see I have two disabilities both occurred while I was on the job one is my back two I have PTSD and I'm not afraid to talk about it and I'll tell you why. The story on my Instagram and Facebook page, I think it's like February or something like that. Um, it's with little Cassius. That's a great story. And so I want you guys to go and read it yourself. It had it went viral, y'all. I think I have I can't remember how many thousands of people that made comments and, and, and shares. It, it went viral. Quick, too. I mean quick. And because uh, it was a great story. But I want you to read it so, you can, so you'll know what the story is all about. But it was getting close to Black History Month. And I reached out to my public affairs department. share this black history because it's a great story to make a long story short I didn't get what I wanted from the public affairs it never got clear so by the end of the black history month I had a few days left and I knew it was a great story so I reached out U.S. Embassy in Freetown, where I work and live. Okay. And I shared that story. I was on the phone for five minutes. And I was told, this is a great story. We got to get this on Facebook Live before the end of the month. Next day, push it up the channels to get cleared. It got cleared within one day. And the following day, I was on Facebook Live, the U.S. Embassy in Free, Free Time, Black History. And that video went, it, it, it went, it was a great video. You got to watch it and see it. It's Facebook Live. So, I just couldn't understand why just couldn't understand a lot of things but anyway so then Grand Empire 34 started to grow especially in Sierra Leone and I was hoping that Ibrahim contact and he did what he shared with me blew me away I think I cried I was so proud of this kid. His story is posted on Facebook and Instagram. I think it was in April. I reached back out to public affairs. This time, they never even responded back to me. True story. It's a great story. show you the benefits of giving back to the community. As a diplomat, it's our job. It's our job as diplomats to embrace the community. 
including the disadvantaged areas. Including. Because we should be about inclusion, diversity and inclusion. That's what our president wants. That's what our Secretary of State wants. Diversity and inclusion. You see, throughout my career, I always went into the disadvantaged communities because I'm from Memphis. I was a disadvantaged youth, so I could relate. Their stories are like mine. I'm no better than them. And also, I played basketball. So you play basketball, you know where you gotta go. If you want good competition, you gotta go to the hood. You can't be afraid. And so, every place I live, I've done something with disadvantaged youth. Because that's my heart. And I think, if you're a U.S. diplomat, if, you don't even have to be a diplomat. If you visit a country, you visit, make, make, take time to go where the locals are. And that's where you, you really learn about the country and the struggles. I, I learned quickly that every place that I worked and lived in, I'm not saying I'm the only one, but the place that I worked and lived in, I didn't see a lot of my colleagues embracing the disadvantaged communities. Oh yeah, they would go to Stellenbosch. Oh yeah, get some wine. But they wouldn't go to Cape Flats, where I was at. If you don't know about the Cape Flats, it's one of the most dangerous neighborhoods in the world. Mitchell Plains, that's where I was at. I went to church there. I have friends there because I didn't look at them because of what they had or what they didn't have. I looked at what was in their heart. They embraced me. They embraced my family. We had no problem because they knew that we were doing something that most Foreigners even would even think about doing because we would, and so and so we would go all over Cape Town, and so Cape Flats, man, yeah, they know I love them. Colors, they know I love them. Colors know I love them. Coasters, they know I love them. Durban, my Indians, they know I love you. I was there, y'all. Bunny Chow, Durban, yeah. Durban's, Durban's one of my favorite cities in South Africa. Yeah. Great beaches, great beaches. But anyway, uh, this is what I believe. I believe it's our job to embrace these communities, all of them. Spend at least 25% of your time. And I'm talking about, and we're not talking about doing work hours. I'm talking about after hours because we're a diplomat 24 seven. After hours, teach your kids to embrace the community and not see color and not see poverty. a negative thing. And that's what I believe in. And I and I just hope one day that uh, a lot of other diplomats worldwide really get what I'm trying to say. It's important to have diversity and inclusion. 
because I'll tell you a story. When I was in Freetown during the Ebola crisis, we used to have events, but I learned that the locals could not attend those events. It was only the American diplomats. When I went to those events, there was a lot of Brits there. Like I said, I was it's only a handful of African Americans at the embassy. And so I just couldn't understand it. The locals are the backbone of the embassy, yet they can't come to an event, but you can invite the British and other people of the, and other members of the diplomatic community. I didn't like that. I did. Not only had they de they have to deal with Ebola, now they have to deal with being excluded. And so what I did for Halloween, I had a Halloween party at my house, and I invited nothing but the locals. No American diplomats were even told. Because I want them to let I want to let them know that I care. I see what you're going through. And we had a blast. And I'm pretty sure they will still talk about that to this day. And that's just who I am. I like inclusion. I like inclusion. So I feel as a diplomat. We should not exclude. We should include. Yeah, and these are special edition. Special edition. They're going to be rare. I'm not going to produce too many of them. Special edition, right? And I'll tell you something. I definitely, the first person I want to give one to is the president of Sierra Leone and First Lady. I want to give him one of my t-shirts. Let him know that, hey, I'm coming. I'm coming to Sierra Leone, and I'm bringing it. My goal is to build basketball courts. And I'm not talking about outdoor basketball courts. They need indoor basketball courts because it rains six months out of the year. So they're at a disadvantage already. They have nowhere to play. So they can't further develop themselves with the game of basketball if the resources aren't there. So that's why I'm coming. I'm coming to advocate for more basketball courts, indoor basketball courts, and also I'm there to educate. And you'll see what I'm talking about when I get there. We got a lot planned. Got a lot planned. My principal advisor. Y'all know who she is. Come on now. Former Miss Sierra Leone. Come on, hey. Competed in Miss World. Community activist. Owner of TYLS Productions and Beach Resorts. She employs hundreds of people to work in her factory and at her resort and all the other things she does. She even has a school I just found out about. So she is a queen boss. She does a lot for her country. She has a great heart and we think alike. So she gives back, and that's what we're gonna do. So we're, we have a great team together. Uh, she's my principal advisor, and she will be coming in October to the United States. She'll meet with the board members, and we, we're gonna have some, some final planning meetings, some countdown meetings, uh, because we're coming in November.
and it's gonna be epic, y'all. And I want to do something real special for, for Sierra Leone. I'm gonna tell you what I'm working on. I'm from Memphis. I have a lot of friends in Memphis. I grew up there. And now, my generation. And I grew up there. I have a lot of friends that are connected also. And so I'm in discussions to bring someone from Memphis that's a legend. This person received an Oscar. Okay? And was a rapper. He received, they received this group. You guys probably know what I'm talking about. They received an Oscar for Hustle and Flow, a movie about myth. know what I want to do because I think big I want to bring that Oscar to Sierra Leone and that's what I'm going to work on if it doesn't happen it doesn't happen but I'm going to do everything I can to get that Oscar on that plane because it's going to provide hope it's going to provide hope to millions of people in Sierra Leone and Africa because it's Sierra Leone time they don't been through so much the civil war that lasted for 10 years so when the war happened there was no school 10 years no school no jobs for 10 years it was a civil war that was recent. We're not talking about 1950. We're talking about 1990s. It's recent. So that generation has a lot, a lot of catching up to do. And I know it. And so that's what I plan on doing. Is That's my favorite country. You know, I've traveled all over the world. Sierra Leone is my favorite. My favorite. Because of the people, because of what they had to go through. And they're still resilient. Civil war, malaria, Ebola, mudslide, poverty, now coronavirus. They need help. And I'm going to give it to them. But I'm also going to Uzbekistan. I got some big plan for you guys. Remember, Uzbekistan, I brought Marty, former NBA player. We traveled for two weeks. Marty Coleman. He's my friend. And we want to come back. We want to come back to Uzbekistan. Cause it was big. We got bigger plans now. So stand by. Hopefully, 2022 in spring, we'll be back in Uzbekistan. And I got some big plans for you. And then that, spring, that summer, 2022, I'm headed to Ecuador. We're coming to Ecuador, y'all. Because the first place I'm going is the Esmeraldas. And the Esmeraldas, they, that's where you see a lot of African Ecuadorians. And I have a good friend there. His name is Vicente. Vicente is an outstanding basketball player. He's older. But in his prime, he could have easily played in the NBA. Easily. But because 
He's from the Esmeraldas in Ecuador. Nobody knew about him other than that little small area. So they got talent out there in the Esmeraldas. And in Quito, and in Guayaquil, and in Manta. That's where we're going. The first stop is to see Vicente, to see how we can support his basketball program. And then after that, the big grand finale, South Africa. That was there the longest. And I got a lot of friends in South Africa. Because, see, on the weekends, I was either in K Flats or at M Zoli's. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Come on, Coastals, where you at? M Zoli's. Yeah. Y'all remember me. Joe Bird, we hitting you too. So we're headed back to South Africa. And I can't wait to get back there. I can't wait to get back to Durban. Beverly Hills Hotel. They know me. I was there all the time. Durban. Where my Zulu's at coming. Durban. My Indian brothers. Y'all know y'all got to give me some of that bunny chow. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Time for me to get ready for my Generation YZ Tea Time Chat with my man, Ibrahim. So I just wanted to say thank you guys for listening. Uh, stay tuned. Uh, like I said, please go to my previous post of about Lil Cassius and Ibrahim. Uh, I'm going to post a video sometime later this week. Uh, it's going to be an incredible story. I promise you that. Get your popcorn for this one. Some of you guys may even start tearing up because I did. Okay. This is an incredible story. Don't want to miss it. Uh, I'm going to post the video on YouTube. Okay. Because I'm trying to move my followers to YouTube because when we go to Sierra Leone, we're going to do vlogs. And I want to do it on YouTube. We're still going to do a lot on Facebook and Instagram, but I want to get my followers also connected to the YouTube channel because that's where we're going to have longer videos. So I will post this incredible interview. Our little tea time chat. It's not an interview. It's just a chat uh, with Abraham. This is the second edition. First one was with Miko. They did extremely well. So stand by. YouTube. All you have to do is search Gray Empire 34. One word. Gray Empire 34. Yeah. Empire 34, y'all. We 3 4, 34. Hey! By the way, 34 is my basketball number in college. I still remember that one. Hey!